Constable Stephen Tynan and Damien Eyre were shot dead in a very public ambush in 1988. Absolutely fresh in my mind, always will be. It was a, a total tragedy to see young people cut down like that. I, I spent, gosh, upwards of a million dollars just buying drugs, you know, giving away money that was all photocopied and uh, photographed and uh, used and proved later for evidence. Welcome back to the Mafia's Web. I'm Stephen Drill. For the past two years, I've been looking into the Italian Mafia while I was working overseas as a correspondent. I've spoken to the brave souls across the globe fighting to curb the Mafia's power. And this podcast looks at how their tactics are changing and what, if anything, can be done to stop them. In this episode, we meet one of the most crucial people in the takedown of the Italian Mafia in Australia, an undercover cop who risked his life to track down the Dons. I was buying drugs quite a lot, pure cocaine in rock form from the Mafia. And uh, one stage they offered me a truckload of cannabis uh, worth, uh, I can't remember, remember how many million. We just did not, did not have enough money to buy it all. That's Colin McLaren. He was Australia's answer to Donnie Brasco, the undercover cop who inspired the Johnny Depp movie. Colin has sent down some serious mafia players in Australia. Some were relatives of those linked to the disappearance of Donald McKay. I had a lot of time with the mafia. Um, of course, for many years, two, two, at least two years, I was undercover in the mafia. That's an infiltration job. Uh, you know, they were they thought I was a dodgy art dealer and their friend. Um, and we did lots and lots of drug deals and discussions and conspiracies and talked all sorts of stuff as well as buying pure cocaine and cannabis. And then it all came crumbling down after a couple of years and they all went to jail. But... I kept my mafia career going after that, uh, chasing other facets of the mafia that I thought were worthy to have a look at. And then uh, there's been other issues along the way with the mafia. So I guess I've had a good career inside and outside the mafia. To this day, Colin keeps his location secret for fear of mafia reprisals. Allow me to say that I'm I'm in the Northern Hemisphere. That, That might do you. Colin was in a squad that targeted the mafia. They risked their lives to gather intelligence wearing wiretaps that were used to secure convictions. The old school methods worked, but they cost a lot of money and time. Italy has continued to invest in those squads, but there are questions about what Australia was doing. A landmark court case now running in Italy gathered 24,000 hours of wiretapped conversations. Colin was a cop in Victoria in the 1980s and had worked on the notorious Wall Street killings. Constable Stephen Tynan and Damien Eyre were shot dead in a very public ambush in 1988. The sensational case inspired the movie Animal Kingdom, for which Aussie actress Jackie Weaver was nominated for an Oscar. Sure, well, it was 23 years ago that the both officers, who were then in their early 20s, uh, turned up to reports of a dumped car. Now, when they arrived, they were ambushed and both shot several times. Now, four men, Victor Pierce. Absolutely fresh in my mind, always will be. It was... Uh, a total tragedy to see young people cut down like that. Colin was reluctant to sign up for the Mafia squad when his bosses asked him to take on the job after such a draining and high-profile case. He had also worked on the Mr Cruel case, one of the most heinous crimes in the 1980s and 1990s in Victoria. Police were hunting for a serial rapist who was the prime suspect in the murder of Carmen Chan. Mr Cruel was the nickname given to the rapist who was suspected of up to a dozen attacks on children. Carmen Chan was only 13 when she was murdered in 1991. A $1 million reward remains in place for information that would lead to Mr. Krull's arrest. I asked Colin how he started working with the Mafia in the first place. How did they sell that for you? Because it's a fairly risky proposition. They did try and sell it. Uh, I'm glad you used that word because I was not interested. I'd just come off a series of task forces in Australia um, and we have task forces for the most, uh, I guess, sensitive and most uh, uh, horrific of crimes. And um, I'd come out of a, at least two or three. And um, you remember the Wall Street murders of the policeman and the, the Mr. Cruel investigation for two years where somebody was killing um, kids and, 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 and kidnapping little kids and raping them and all sorts of atrocities. Um, I was a team leader there as well. I did not want any of that sort of high-level work anymore for a while, and uh, I, I was just called into the office just, and we're just doing a, a relocation of who was in charge of what squads or what, what teams, and they said, oh, we're going to move you to we put you in charge of the mafia. And I said, you're kidding. You know, I, I, I just want to go and uh, do something easy. Reluctantly, he took the job 
putting his duty above his fears about his own personal safety. But it wasn't just himself he was worried about. He also had a family who could be put at risk. Uh, I guess because I was task force hardened, you know, it's a different style of investigative work, Stephen. You know, you have to understand that the squads are, the, I suppose, the elite and the insofar as they have everything, all the resources and all the capabilities and all the talent to get on with the hardest of uh, investigations like homicides or, you know, major conspiracies or drug importers and all sorts of, you know, armed robbery teams back then. But uh, the next level is, I guess, task forces where they get all of that plus, plus, plus and a huge budget and everything's thrown at it. And I'd had... uh, two task force assignments each for a couple of years. So I was task force savvy and hardened and they could just, I was there and and I was happy doing my work with my team. But they said, no, we've really got to look at the mafia and we've got an agenda here. We've got from parliament to investigate the mafia and the job's yours. And I refused and it was quite tense. I said, I'm not interested. Anyway, I was told what to do. We've got to remember the police department You've, you, know, you get told what to do there. It's not really um, something where you pick and choose. Colin was an astute choice. He had already worked undercover in Victoria and knew the ropes. I had a, a about two years undercover um, and just doing, you know, the garden variety day-to-day undercover jobs in um, Victoria, in Melbourne and in Sydney. And uh, and that, that really served me well. So I had the experience and I was also – qualified and had done all the courses as well. So I knew all the legislation and all the requirements. So that had, a, um, I guess, an impact on me. And when you do go through those serious courses, and back then it was very, very serious. So, you know, the covert investigation unit was absolutely on top of their game and they were very elite and they took the best practices from the very best undercover squads around the world. And I was lucky enough to go on tour to a few of them and learn from them. So that was my background before I got into task force policing. Colin also monitored reports coming out of America. They were about the work of undercover detective Joe Pistoni, who had the undercover name Donnie Brasco. That story inspired Johnny Depp's movie of the same name. But Colin was interested in real-life methods, not the Hollywood treatment. When you do all of the um, COVID investigation courses and training and experience, you learn about cover stories and the importance of a cover story, who you're going to be, who you're going to pretend to be. And in that, with the experience, you learn to bluff your way into your target or targets, your organisation you're trying to infiltrate, whether it's an outlaw motorcycle gang, whether it's drug importers, whether it's the mafia, it doesn't matter who it is. So you really adapt yourself. And I remember very well back then, um, many years earlier to to when I was undercover, there was a man called Joe Pistoni from America and his undercover name was Donnie Brasco. And uh, of course, that was made into a fabulous movie with Johnny Depp. And um, he really, I guess, is the grandfather or the godfather perhaps of infiltrations and undercover work, he went for five years into the mafia and he worked slowly and slowly and slowly and got himself deeper and into it and into the group and infiltrated them properly, it took all that time. And he wrote, the, I guess, the, the rule book for us. He was an inspiration. And I remembered that and I remember studying that case and I thought, well, if he did it in, in – um, with the Bonanno family in New York City, why can't we do it in Griffith or in Australia? So I adopted his principle and come up with a great cover story as Donny Brasco had. He was posing as a dodgy jeweller or fence of stolen jewellery and I posed as a dodgy art dealer, mover of, of uh, artworks and able to launder money. So I jumped in the pond and uh, within two years we had them all locked up. Colin's passion was art. He had built up his knowledge during his travels in his teens through Europe, but then he took it to the next level. Well, I took off overseas when I was 19 and uh, for my first trip to the Northern Hemisphere to Europe in 
UK, like most people do, that sort of birthright to travel. And um, I remember being overwhelmed by the art uh, of Europe, European artists like uh, Van Gogh and Picasso and, well, you know, I won't get, in, get into an art lesson here, but I, I was amazed at all of this new art I was seeing and that developed a real interest for me. And that's the key to an undercover story. If you're going to have an undercover story, like Donny Brasco, he was a dodgy jeweller. You have to know something about jewellery, otherwise you're not going to last five minutes, particularly with a mafia, if they're going to put a, you know, a diamond in front of you or a ruby in front of you or a dodgy one, and try and trick you. Uh, the same goes with art. I had a great uh, love for art and still do have, and so I was able to develop a cover story through art. And my great passion was Australian art. So what I did was um, study a little bit harder and then uh, once I got myself up to speed and, went, and confident enough to go into the mafia as an, an art dealer, I went and saw a friend of a girlfriend of uh, a mate of mine and she was uh, doing a PhD in Australian art and I said, fire every question you can at me and she sort of knew that there was something going on, didn't know what, and she spent a lot of time doing Q and A with me, and I, I passed her her exam. She said, "You know, you know a lot about Australian art." I said, "That'll do me, thank you." And I went off and got a sports car, and we put a budget together and an apartment, and then I found an undercover policewoman girlfriend who acted as my partner, and uh, printed brochures and stationery and calling cards and all sorts of things. And the undercover um, cover story was really. I think, the best we've ever seen. Colin says that his team were good at their jobs, but crucially, they had the cash to back it up. He was worried that there was not enough focus and resources now dedicated to tackling the mafia. In his day, the police were not penny-pinching. I spent, gosh, upwards of a million dollars just buying drugs, you know, giving away money that was all photocopied and uh, photographed and uh, used and proved later for evidence which helped all the prosecutions. Our prosecutions were seamless, really. They were wonderfully put together by a great team. We had the best team and um, everything went very, very well. But the overall cost for two years and probably 16 detectives and surveillance and um, cars and audio equipment, state-of-the-art technology would be uh, many millions of dollars. The work was dangerous and there was the constant fear of being unmasked. Colin was not just chasing small fish. He had infiltrated the top echelons of the Griffith Mafia. He made friends with relatives of Bob Trimboli, the Mafia boss who died in 1988. That's the guy we spoke about earlier, who was accused of the murder of Donald McKay. The work was tough. He had to constantly be away to protect his cover story. You are living like this all the time. You're always wondering whether your cover story is going to be exposed or whether someone will walk in the door of the club you're in or the nightclub or the wherever you were doing business and recognize you. It's just one of the perks of the trade. But I was buying drugs quite a lot, pure cocaine in rock form from the mafia. And uh, one stage they offered me a truckload of cannabis uh, worth, uh, I can't remember, remember how many million. Um, we just did not, did not have enough money to buy it all. So another day it was 10 massive green gar bags of skunkweed heads. You can imagine the cost of that. Um, we uh, scrambled to get enough money for that out of out of the police fund. Um, and it, it cost a small fortune. And uh, we had to get a truck to drive that away, but um, a little truck. But we were constantly buying drugs to, um, just to buy evidence to show who these people really were and the, and the, I guess, extent of their commerciality. And... We, in the, in the end, just had to stop buying drugs only because we ran out of money. And then there was the pressure of taking on such dangerous people. It came at a cost to Colin's personal life. It was tough. Um, I was very lucky to be single. Um, I, I say that because, you know, I'm never one to sort of have long marriages um, I've tried and it doesn't sort of last long, I guess, because of the work and the pressures, but not to make that the excuse. But I, I remember I was I was single with a very, very um, nice girlfriend back then 
and um, the pressure on that relationship pretty well disintegrated it. Um, and I also have um, family, which I don't talk about to anybody, but someone very precious to me. Um, and, uh, you know, things were tough and there was months of seeing each other in strange locations um, just to, you know, try and be a father. And uh, unfortunately, um, that, that, that had enormous pressures and I won't go on anymore. But suffice to say, um, whilst the girlfriend <laughs> didn't last long, um, my um, beautiful child did and, uh, and the, you know, that's the way things go. But um, we're as strong and as good as anything and that's probably all I'll say. But Colin's cover was perfect. Soon he was taking part in major drug importations and all the while he was gathering evidence. I had a couple of trips up north. I remember I'm from Melbourne and I was infiltrating the Griffith Mafia, which is, of course, in central New South Wales. And uh, they hatched a plan, which I got involved in, a conspiracy to import 100 kilos of cocaine from Colombia and also another separate conspiracy to import a plane load of skunkweed, which is the highest THC um, cannabis you can get, uh, and it's in huge demand. And that was to be imported from New Guinea, from the mountains of New Guinea. And we knew that drug route well in law enforcement, New Guinea into Queensland, and then down the eastern seaboard into the major cities around Australia. So that this was an opportunity for us to tap into this sort of, I guess, well-trodden drug path. And I got involved in, or invited into this conspiracy with the mafia. There was meetings all coming from Sydney and Griffith and around Melbourne and Adelaide to get involved. And they all had meetings um, at a certain hotel in Melbourne. And we were able to get into the hotel and wire it from top to bottom rooms. It was a massive suite they were using. And we then uh, were able to put all the phones off, all, all the players. We watched them all come in to this big uh, meeting or series of meetings. And then we um, were lucky enough that I got an invite as a dodgy art dealer into this meeting to see if I could find a plane because I was struggling to find a plane for one key reason they told me was their name, their Italian ethnicity. Colin says his greatest weakness in the mafia was that he was not from Italian heritage. But on the drug trips to North Queensland, that was an asset. They said, well, you're, you're a skippy, you're, you're an Aussie, you can um, rent the plane. Can, would you do this? You, would you come in, um, in on this uh, scam? And I said, yeah, of course I would. I'd been buying, of course, pure cocaine in rock form, kilos at a time, by then. So my credibility was okay. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll play this. So that was my task, was to try and hire the plane. They were doing everything else, the, you know, the drugs and the distribution and getting it from New Guinea and all those sorts of things. So we had to go up to New Guinea um, or to Cape Horn to a Thursday Island and uh, we did a dry run and that, that involved sort of three days up there with three different people within the mafia, myself, and uh, we were able to then um, – I guess, do all the logistics with the mafia and tape record everything. They didn't know that the, the plane that I hired, we were able to fit it out top to bottom with listening devices and and those also we were able to set up aerials to ping our conversations, their conversations off the, sat the satellite and everywhere we flew, the, their conversations bounced off satellites back to our Melbourne office and were recorded and translated. Um nor did they know that the pilot I chose they thought was a criminal was in fact a, a, a sergeant of police who was uh, um, a lecturer, I think, at one of the academies. Wow. And um, I had a little brother I brought into the organisation. I told them that he was a, a problem, uh, a criminal, and I was uh, trying to get him on the straight and narrow. He could be involved, help loading the plane. So they took that okay. It took quite a while, but they took that okay. And uh, so the, I guess the six of us took off and 
we got involved in this big conspiracy and we had to go through the jungles up there at Weeper, in, then into Horn Island and there was a sort of mosquito coast atmosphere and it was in the head of summer, so it was pretty hot and we got all logis- logistics right. But unluckily for the mafia, everything was recorded. A team of police had bugged the plane. Police monitored their movements and it all ended up as evidence in court. So we, we were doing those sorts of things and then, of course, in, in intimately buying large quantities of drugs and getting all the evidence right and recording of that, that evidence. Again, this is a team effort, massive team that was behind, um, I guess, that covert wall that were uh, transcribing and setting, setting up all of the, the dubbing of tapes and getting the evidence um, and the continuity of all those that evidence right for the courts. And in the end, it was massive, the biggest brief I think the courtroom had seen at, at this point. And we rolled these trolleys and trolleys of evidence in at the end. And in the end, apart from a well, a well fought set of committals in court, all the trials were pleads of guilty, only because of the extraordinary work of the team behind me, all the great detectives and technicians and all of the transcribers. The best, best uh, job I've ever been on. Colin had a major win against the Mafia and dented their operations. But that was in the 1990s, and their power has only grown since. Colin told me why there was a sudden shift away from a focus on the Mafia. Another threat entered the picture. What happened was uh, 9-11 came along and that, that atrocity helped uh, shift attention from the mafia at that time, which was, as I just said, very well resourced. The bombs, bombs went off, the planes exploded um, in the Twin Towers and around America and the whole world's attention shifted to terrorism and the other M word, the Muslim community, they were... Um, the focus of all law enforcement budgets from then on, whereas the mafia word um, got the back bleaches and uh, it's remained that way ever since now for almost 20 years and that in itself is a sin because the mafia has only grown and grown and grown and no one's looking at them, certainly in Australia, and if you hear differently, then I would question what you hear. Colin says Australian police should collaborate more with Italian authorities. He pointed to the arrest of the Mancuso clan and the trial of more than 350 mob bosses, which is currently happening in Italy over Zoom. So what you've got in Italy is a fantastic and dedicated bunch of investigators, the anti-mafia unit, which is not just police, it's also lawyers and there's there's accountants and uh, very skilled technicians, everybody joined together. It's massive. And what they do is they police their country with, for all the mafia mafia and and, uh, all of the extortion crimes and murders and drugs, etc. They don't leave it alone. It's only got bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is in contrast to Australia where it's got smaller and smaller and virtually there's no uh, mafia investigations in Australia. Why? I've explained 9-11 caused a lot of that, the shift of attention. But in Italy, what's happened is um, the mafia don't go away. Why should they? They're in about making money, as much as money as they can, and extorting as much from the state or from poor individuals. And th- how are you ever going to see that go away? That's just the human nature to, to extort, particularly with criminals. But what's happened is the anti-mafia unit in Italy have just got bigger and bigger, and they're attacking and constantly attacking, but there's no one in the world, no law enforcement agencies in the world that is supporting that same effort. There's little trickles going on in America, Canada, around Europe, Germany in particular, um, Holland in particular, Australia, no. So they're not being properly supported in the Interpol world and you're seeing basically uh, the Italians fighting like a prize fight with one one arm and they're, they're doing great things. And recently they have um, mounted a, a prosecution of 300, 355 mafiosi figures, men, killers, drug dealers, ex, extorters, in one court case which has become known as the contemporary maxi trial and 
there's a whole team of prosecutors involved. One of them, the head prosecutor, is Mr. Gallieri, and he is bravely standing in front of the anti-mafia police prosecuting with all of his other prosecutors, 355 men, killers and drug dealers. And this will go on for two years, and this is being held as we speak for the next two years in Calabria. Now, that none of that's happening in Australia, yet there is widespread mafia activity in Australia, in every other country in the old Commonwealth, um, particularly in uh, America as well and across Europe, and Australia is just lagging behind. It's just appalling. It's very sad to see this, and it's as if our Attorney Generals, it's as if our Attorneys General have decided that, uh, that they have no priority with Italian organised crime. What Colin didn't know, and what very few people in the world knew, was that the sting of the century was about to break. Police had been sitting on a gold mine of information gleaned from organised crime itself, and crime rings across the globe were about to be smashed. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. This podcast was hosted by me, Stephen Drill, and produced by Andrea Tees-Evanson. 